We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us here today for the session of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries. Um, my name is Stephen Weiber. I am Director for Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And we are honoured to work with colleagues around the world and different organisations in order to take forward the work of the Dynamic Coalition. Now, as you can probably imagine from the name or perhaps the name of the coalition, we believe very strongly in the importance of public access as a model for helping to make sure that everyone has the possibility to get online, to take advantage of all the opportunities that the Internet offers. But in fact, the, what, the real contribution that public access provides isn't just in terms of getting people online, but it's when you look at everything that comes with it all of the aspects, all of the unique characteristics that public organisations, publicly focused organisations like libraries provide in order to make connectivity meaningful. And we can look beyond that. That actually allows us to move from simply looking at connectivity itself to thinking more broadly about how can we, through public access, through the unique opportunities, the unique characteristics of this public access, drive a new local development model because I think certainly what we've heard so many times in pronouncements and efforts to respond to COVID is this idea that we do need a fairer future. We do need new local development models that include everyone. We need connectivity to be part of that. And crucially, I think we'll want to argue, and I think you'll hear a lot of good examples of this today. We'll also want to talk about, um, you'll hear a lot of good examples of this today, the specific role that libraries and the public access can play in helping us build back better, respond to COVID, make sure we're doing things better now than before. So we're going to hear from a wide range of really excellent speakers from around the world who will show that, well, of course, we'll be talking about local development models and how we can promote, promote more inclusive local development. Crucially, this is a thing that works around the world. This is something that we hope that all governments will be looking at, all governments will be reflecting on, how can we make better use of public access, of public access and libraries in particular, to drive growth. So with that, I will be introducing our speakers one at a time as we go along. Um, I would therefore, first of all, like to invite Valencia Dresvianikova from the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, who will talk a little bit and this helps set the scene by presenting some research that's been carried out, looking at evidence of those impacts and how we calculate those impacts. What's the difference that public access can make for individual and for local development. Over to you, Valencia. You're muted, Valencia, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. This should work now, hopefully. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, and hello, everyone. It's great to see both new and familiar faces here. Uh, well, indeed, when we talk about the link between public access and connectivity and development, one of the fundamental questions at hand is how does public access uh, make a difference? In what ways does it help bring people online and what further benefits does that help generate? And that's exactly the question that the uh, draft new paper by DC Pal aims to explore. It looks at uh, recent evidence in studies and reports produced in different parts of the world, which document the impacts of public access, some at national levels, some at local, or at the level of individual libraries. Uh, now, of course, all their experiences are very unique. So with all due uh, caution about interpreting very different studies from a very different contexts, what can we actually say about the impacts of public access uh, today? Well, question one is, of course, who benefits? Now, it comes as no surprise that the profiles of public access users vary a lot across different locations. In some places, uh, we see that it's widely used by older community members, in others by students and learners, in some by women, others by men, and so on. But crucially, several studies highlight another important consideration 
who among public access users does and does not have alternative means of access. Um, here we can see examples of some user groups which are more likely to rely on public access as their main or only means of accessing the internet or ICTs. In some locations, it was self-employed workers or job seekers. In others, it was older users or those with a lower income or rural dwellers. Um, so these are some of the potentially more vulnerable or underserved groups that uh, particularly benefit from public access. And then again, even when alternatives are available, what we see is that other patrons cited various reasons for using public access. Um, some in order to get staff support with digital queries, um, others to use other ICTs like printers or scanners, some because it's convenient, uh, some because it is free or for a change in scenery or as a supplement to other services provided at the location and many, many other reasons. A second question is, uh, how is public access used? To what ends? Here, there are interesting examples of both uses and impacts, actually. Uh, for example, in both Bhutan and Moldova, public access was fairly extensively used for getting in touch with relatives abroad. In Ghana, mobile libraries uh, equipped with public access helped offer digital skills classes in schools, leading to a rise in passing rates in national exams on ICT. Um, there are impacts on job seeking reported, for example, in Toronto Public Libraries, uh, while other users there have completed digital creative projects. Elsewhere, reported impacts include time and money saved, for example, by making it possible to access e-government services. Now, another key impact area is digital skills building enabled by public access, anything from uh, basic ICT skills to advanced competencies. And here there are also examples of tailored programs and their impacts from robotics classes for students which saw then a positive impact on school performance in math and related subjects to training on ICT fundamentals for seniors, which can help boost their independence or use of digital resources. Now, interestingly, on the spot on site support seems to also be an important factor here. For example, in both New Zealand and in the UK, library staff reported substantial, in some cases every day, demand for such support among patrons. Questions can range from uh, fundamentals like how to use a computer, mouse and keyboard to more specific things like finding travel information or accessing a specific website. These are just some of the reported impacts. It of course goes further if we consider value added services like lifelong learning, local content creation and more. Now, the second, key, uh, the second key part of the draft paper actually looks at the many different ways that public access can and have uh, been measured, the impacts of it. So what we see is in fact a wide variety of tools at our disposal and several key sources of information we could turn to. On the one hand, collecting data from public access vendors can offer insights on the availability of public access, what services are offered and where, their traffic and usage, possible funding mechanisms, what kind of support staff can offer, and so on. On the other hand, data gathering among public access users can offer insights on the demand side of things. So who uses facilities uh, in terms of various demographics, especially, why they choose to use it, and what kinds of activities they carry out. This can also help ask exploratory questions like what barriers are there to digital inclusion uh, users that the user experience, what public access enabled services they'd like to see introduced, um, and so on. At the same time, both groups can offer insights on how users benefit from this access and what impacts it has on their lives, whether it's costs they avoided, skills they developed, and so on and so on. Um, all these can be done by both quantitative measures like surveys and qualitative like interviews or focus groups. As a standalone category, uh, we could also highlight efforts to assess the economic value of public access. For example, by looking at prices of market alternatives and savings that public access enables, or contingent valuation, what are users willing to pay for access or willing to accept compensation as compensation for losing the, the access to the service. And finally, uh, taking a broader look at the perspectives among the general population or among non-users can also really uh, yield valuable data. Such surveys can offer insights on how extensively public access is used among the general population at large, 
uh, motivations for both use and non-use, other means of going online, and overall perceptions and the value of public access. And of course, lots of studies mix and match different elements from the above uh, to gain an even more nuanced and granular picture. So with this in mind, we of course hope to see further efforts to measure and better capture the impacts of public access. And we're looking forward to an engaging and productive discussion today and in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valencia, for setting out some of the evidence there. And we're very happy that we've published a draft version of a report that sets out a lot of the arguments and the evidence that Valencia set out there. And um, we, of course, welcome comments. So take a look at IFL social media, take a look at IFL, E-I-F-L, social media, in order to find the link. And of course, we welcome feedback in order to make this as, as useful a resource as possible. So there we've had sort of the global view of, of the evidence that there is of the different ways in which public access is contributing, which is making a difference and which is contributing to a more equitable, a more inclusive model of development. What we want to do now is really look around the world to really deliver on what I talked about earlier about this being a model that can actually make a difference in different parts of the world that really does provide a solution, a, a solution that contributes to that goal of universal, meaningful connectivity. For that, we're really happy to have four panelists from Asia, from Europe, from uh, Africa, and from Latin America and the Caribbean, who will talk to us, who will share their ideas and their experiences about how this makes a difference, how those different aspects of public access make a difference. So first of all, I would like to invite Yuan Oktafian to the stage. And Yuan is an independent consultant with a background in library and information science and data. Yuan is a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group at the Indonesia Internet Governance Forum and a board member of the Association of Library and Information Professionals in Indonesia. Yuan, over to you. I was looking for the microphone. I cannot. You, you found it. It's yes. good. <laughs> okay. So I just I start setting. Uh, can you see my screen now? That works. We can see the back end, so it's not full screen. Okay. Uh, so slideshow. Sorry. Ah, I think I let me just I do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's also okay, is that? We, it's big enough. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a story from Indonesia, actually. It started in uh, 2011, uh, where uh, when Purpuseru, uh, well, Purpuseru is uh, come from the word uh, library and fun. Uh, Purpustakaan Seru, so in short, is Purpuseru. Is, uh, is a program organized by the Coca-Cola Foundation, alongside with the Bill and Melinda Get Foundation uh, uh, support. So the, the aim of this program is uh, developing uh, the public libraries uh, into a community learning center and pro uh, by providing information technology-based services. Uh, this program is led by uh, Erlin Sulistian Ningsi. Uh, she's a wonderful and passionate lady. And um, the, the strategy is not really that that complicated actually, it's quite simple, the strategies. It has a three strategy. So first, uh, the program improved the computer and the internet services. Second, it's conduct community development. The third, establish library support system. So uh, to, uh, simple action, sometimes it's just redesigning the layout to make it more comfortable. Sometimes it's just increasing the internet bandwidth so it can be faster. Sometimes just providing wireless access uh, point, just a Wi-Fi or additional computer so uh, more people can use uh, the resources. And then the other strategy is the most important one, actually, the community development. It can be very uh, sewing, knitting, uh, or a simple uh, digital literacy and how to use Google Map, access YouTube, understanding and using AdWord AdSense, uh, how they decide which uh, kind of training or which kind of uh, community development need to be uh, conducted is they do a need analysis. They, they also do uh, 
uh, an assessment is there any local resources that can help can share their so like like a champion a local champion if they cannot find it uh, they will uh, look further so it's connecting the dot that's what happening in the in the community development uh, assessing the need and connecting the dot then uh, establish the support uh, system it's, it's easier because um, the the library already uh, what conduct the training said they already uh, do do all the tasks so it's just about writing what they do it's develop a proposal develop a work plans and then uh, being assist to get support from the local district private sector or uh, or others so those are the three strategy actually and then uh, the statistic is in 2011 after about eight years there are 780 uh, 768 public libraries in the village and two-thirds are being supported by the local district the budget and resources though, so they can sustain and then the program end but the success need to be continued so the is also get a full support from the national planning agency BAPNAS, uh, and become Indonesian national strategy uh, as part of the poverty affiliation uh, national library as the leading sector also expand the network and involve other ministry it get a new name literacy untuk kesejahteraan literacy for a building because uh, well in indonesia the middle class is quite vulnerable actually the, uh, we consume a lot but we produce very few we import a lot so that's why uh, okay the other part is the national library also add a new color to the program it called the information literacy it wasn't really introduced it in in a systematic way uh, previously but then the library the national library add this so so in short uh, for those who's not familiar the information literacy is uh, using information as basis to make decision and solving problem so basically it's a set skill to become a lifelong uh, learner so and and, and one one of the skill is to evaluate the evaluation skill can be used to determine information qualities this can also be used to identify uh, hoax or hoax or misinformation something that we see like almost every day uh, and it's take it to another level it's not just identifying but also use the information to solve problems and the Indonesian uh, IL model is uh, uh, aiming to produce good and services because we are trying to uh, to 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 get yeah to, to have more more products and to have more services not just uh, uh, spending or shopping. Uh, what else? Okay, um, this is one of the success story. There are there are plenty actually. Uh, this is one of the success story. Uh, 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 Asnawati was invited to give a training, a share session to, to the community, to how to make Sankap. And then the library also helped to promote in social media and website. And previously, Anna Asnawati only sell it uh, through local stores. But then uh, she see new opportunity. She see after being promoted, after being uh, introduced to the community, it's get expanded. Uh, requests are coming from uh, all over the place and then she have a uh, new customer from outside her district so it's, it's kind of simple actually for most of us probably for most of you from from the uh, more more developed countries but uh, this sort of thing can make a lot of different actually um i think that's it from indonesia story thank you so much Yuan. perfect so thank you very much. I might ask you to take down your slide, but I think already there's some incredibly rich examples in there. I think your point about this combination of connectivity, but also the specific space and skills that the library can provide. So it's a space for the community that it, as a community institution, but also the fact that it's, it's a place staffed with people who really can assess those local needs and that focus on needs assessment as a key driver of how a program is put together is a really interesting one. And of course, it's such a great evidence of impact when the program is so successful and it makes such a difference that it's taken on as a public service that it continues to be supported. So thank you so much for that. 
So I think now we're going to move on to, uh, we're going to move back to, to, to Poland, in fact, physically and in terms of the stories that we're, that we're talking about here. Um, we're going to invite Magdalena Gomułka, who is an instructor at the Silesian Library in Katowice and a convener of the new professional special interest group at the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions. So Magda, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, for having Hello. Oh, yeah, this one is right. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you, Stefan, <laughs> for having introduced me as a Paul and uh, resident of Katowice. I would like to warm welcome you here in my city as well as online. Uh, I'm honored to take part in this session uh, as a Polish representative uh, and consider it as an appreciation of our work. I hope and believe that this event uh, will be place of open debate and we will have, uh, we will make it possible to share our experience. Today I will be talking about Polish libraries and uh, how they support digital inclusion. Let me first give you a brief overview of my presentation. Uh, I hope that you see my presentation. Oh, yes, thank you. And I'm going to present a history, uh, some statistics and examples of activities in libraries. And then my colleague Agnieszka Koszowska will present a short video prepared in public libraries. It is now that contemporary library changes its image. It has been associated with lending books for decades. Today, it is transforming to a library media center which meets different needs of the users. Computers appeared in Polish libraries at the beginning of the 90s. They helped readers to find information about collections, collections quickly and easily. The internet helped to find information not only quicker and easier, but also from around the world. IT equipment in Polish libraries has developed with a big support from ministries of digital affairs and culture, as well as foundations. From 2004 until now, librarians applied for funding grants allowing them to provide computers, internet networks, as well as printers and cameras. In this slide, you can see names of projects which helps libraries to meet community needs and promote science. Access to information became more direct, which means librarians could be a kind of internet resource guides. Okay, now let me leave the history and move on to my next point. According to a 2020 study, conducted by the Statistical Office and National Library in Warsaw, there are over 900 libraries in total, 7,782 public libraries and 1,413 scientific and professional libraries. Moreover, as you can see, five over 5 million readers almost 6 million almost 6 million readers were registered including almost 5 million in public libraries i would like to direct your attention to this table with numbers of computers with internet access available to readers this service is offered in 78% scientific libraries 87% public libraries and 98% of pedagogical libraries. Speaking with my colleagues from Silesian region, I found out that every group of readers have a special purpose in using computers in libraries. For example, seniors uh, learn how, how to use computers in their daily life. And so they prepare uh, 
bank transfers or fill in documents for, uh, for City Hall. Teenagers spend uh, in library time between school uh, classes and uh, extra activities. Right, let's move on to Wi-Fi and broadband internet. The access in, the, in uh, different types of libraries is quite similar and amounts to 61 and 69 percent. What's more, the data about public libraries indicate the internet access in urban and rural areas. Based on, my, based on my findings, most libraries offer the internet access on the same level. In order to explain the issue in a better way, I would like you to show the latest ACT for public administration research. This study stated that there is no difference where, whether you live in a city or village. On the one hand, almost all houses with children have the internet, so this might be something obvious for teenagers. On the other hand, 27% of seniors do not have such access, which reminds me that this service in libraries could be still needed. I would like to stop for a moment and concentrate on academic libraries. They have a huge impact on developing open access and digitalization. Add to this, forming coalitions with NGOs and institutions support the creation of open educational resources and promoted best practices. Developing digital library allows not only to protect documents, but also to integrate institutions and people. A few examples here. Federation of Digital Libraries brings together over 150 registered digital libraries. And in the Digital Library in the Silesian Library in Katowice, produced over 1,754,000 scans. And let me elaborate a little further on training librarians and library users. There are a few ways in which librarians can develop IT skills. One example that demonstrates this is workshops organized by regional public libraries, foundations and institutions. Librarians learn how to use tablets, apps and robots, and then they share the experience with their users. Another example, in, example is a project that allows librarians to be IT advisors in the local community. Polish readers attend many campaigns promoting digital skills such as Hour of Code, Safer Internet Day, Open Access Week, as well as All Digital Week. To bring my presentation to close, I would like to recall words from many AGF sessions here. We are surrounded by technology and we definitely live in a world of over information. Library as a trusted places for a community give a possibility to learn, develop skills and find the, tr the truth. With this in mind, I would like to give the floor to my colleague who will present the video showing the experience of library users. Agnieszka. Please come on. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Agnieszka from uh, Inter uh, <laughs> Information Society Development Foundation. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me uh, to uh, present you a short movie uh, which illustrates the, the data about public access. Uh, uh, to the internet and to technology in uh, public libraries in Poland and uh, examples of uh, digital education activities that uh, libraries are 
uh, doing. Uh, it is very important to stress that uh, public libraries, especially in, in rural areas, are usually the only places that are available free of charge to everyone. They are open to all, to various age groups, uh, to children, youth, adults, uh, seniors, including vulnerable people who do not know entirely how to use the internet and uh, public services uh, and various online services on the net. So on this movie, I really <laughs> hope that uh, we will be able to show it. Uh, you can see uh, the examples of uh, the library's activities and also um, people, the residents who show uh, what they have learned uh, in the libraries and how beneficial uh, it is for them. Byliśmy w kursy właśnie dla osób starszych, dla seniorów, osób, które nigdy nie miały kontaktu albo słabo obsługują komputer, nie znają internetu. W bibliotece skorzystałam ze szkolenia z obsługi tableta, komputera, co przełożyło się na sprawniejsze poruszanie się w internecie w tym zakresie. Uczyłam, no na pewno się nauczyłam wielu rzeczy. Nauczono nas założyć osobiste konto, e, uczono nas e, e, zakupów, e, jak do koszyka włożyć tam w tych zakupach. I co się ciekawego dowiedziałam, czego do tej pory nie wiedziałam, że mogę sprawdzić, co internet o mnie wie. No i się okazało, że trochę za dużo. Był też kurs połączony z telefon, tablet, robienie zdjęć, wchodziliśmy na narzędzia, bibliotekę, robiliśmy filmy, robiliśmy różne kolaże. Że cyfryzacja to jest nasza codzienność. W tej chwili jest trudno sobie wyobrazić bez życia komputera czy tabletu, no ewentualnie komórka, bo w komórce też mamy internet. więc miał na celu przede wszystkim pokazać, że internet jest dobrodziejstwem XXI wieku, ale też musimy się nauczyć mądrze z niego korzystać.
you very much, Dziękuję bardzo, and thank you in particular for the reminder of the fantastic Polish word cyfryzacja, which is it's a it's a play on words. It's something like digital civilization, but the idea that when we're talking about digital, we shouldn't just be thinking about the purely technical, we need to be thinking about all of those aspects that go into community, into society, into civilization. So thank you for the reminder there of, of that term in Polish. Um, thank you too, just also for underlining that, that really key point that through this access and libraries, supported access and libraries, by doing this, not only are you potentially helping such a huge variety of different people, so many different groups can benefit, but they can also benefit in so many different ways. I know a library computer can help a senior, an older person communicate with their family or fill in a form. It can help a younger person develop new skills. It can help a parent access government services. So there's so many things that can be achieved through this one investment. One thing in particular that you mentioned there that I know we'll now come on to more is the topic of open access and the importance of, <laughs> I see the comment in the chat, I'll try and spell it right for you, Teddy, shortly. Um, um, one of the key, one of the points mentioned there was the importance of open access and making sure that there's access to content, content that actually makes a difference, content that's locally relevant. But again, I said it's not just about connectivity, we also need people to be able to access materials that matter for them, that make the internet something valid. And so in order to explore that, I'm really happy that we're moving to Africa now, and I would like to invite Alice Kibombo to the floor, who is the Wikimedian at Residence, AFLIA, that's African Library and Information Association Institutions. She's a member of the Wikimedia Community User Group Uganda, and has coordinated and facilitated various Wikimedia projects and glam-related campaigns throughout Africa. With that, Alice, I'd like to hand the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I did not believe that it was me being introduced at that point. It's uh, almost 2 p.m. here in Kampala, so good afternoon and good morning because people are tuning in from various parts of the world. My name is Alice Chibombo, as I have been introduced. I am based in Kampala in Uganda. Um, please um, accept my apologies because of the low bandwidth here. I will not be able to share my video, but I expect to present a likeness of myself at some point in time. Once again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share about the work we have been doing in relation to public access and in the network of librarians that are based in Africa. So for the last year or so, I have been engaged as a Wikipedian in residence with AFLIA and uh, this engagement started sometime last year and uh, slowly coming to the end. And uh, first I will let you know uh, what the project was all about, the rationale for the project, the situation that existed before the project, how we executed it, what happened in there, and then what's happening now that the project has been, uh, is coming to its end. I've also shared a link in the chat area to the report of this, uh, my magnus opus, I hope you'll be able to read it. I'll be making a lot of reference to it. Let me see if I can me, uh, navigate this screen. So basically the Wikipedia in African Libraries project was a partnership between AFLIA and it was uh, funded by the Wikimedia Foundation. And um, uh, it was uh, the rationale behind that was that um, AFLIA, it's a not-for-profit organization, same as the Wikimedia Foundation, it's based in Ghana, but then it provides some form of oversight and it is present in over 30 African countries. And it has as many as 208 member institutions. Those are just the member institutions in all areas of the information sector. But uh, the numbers there are quite much more than the 208 member institutions. 
and it also caters for Anglophone, Francophone, and Lusophone speakers. But never before had there been an engagement to introduce the network that AFLIA had to the resource that Wikipedia was. Um, I use Wikipedia very carefully and not Wikimedia because Wikimedia is the mother of them all and it has so many projects. But as AFLIA, we chose to specifically cater to the Encyclopedia project, which is Wikipedia. So that was the existing situation and the network that AFLIA had to offer. And uh, before uh, we could actually unleash this next big thing onto the uh, African Information Society or the collective of it, we did a pre-course survey and uh, we had a number of respondents. There were over 400 respondents before we started and 80% spoke English, French were 9.1% and the Portuguese were relatively fewer. And I'll tell you the relevance of these statistics because they were very crucial when it came to planning. And then we also realized that 63% of over 400 respondents were not aware that there were any Wikimedia affiliates in their countries. And 70% um, were reliant on mobile data. There were more females than male and uh, the demographic was between 31 and 50 years. So this brought up we had to design materials for English speakers primarily, and then translate to French, and then also look at ways of connecting um, the open knowledge movement affiliates in local countries to these respondents. And because very many people were uh, reliant on mobile data, we had to look for user-friendly options. Uh, the gender gap, will come in later and also the fact that they were between 31 to 50 years. These are people who have been practicing for quite a while and they actually hold some kind of influence, not just on national policy, but on institutional policy and how such programs can be embedded in the work that they do. So what happened over the next months that came? We adapted the OCLC curriculum. Uh, we put it into five sections that could leverage participants' existing skills and also show them how they could practically apply them in their communities of practice. And we divided the course into three. We had a pilot group and two cohorts with 150 participants each. And because very many people are reliant on mobile data, we used email, but then we used a lot of WhatsApp and Telegram. WhatsApp is actually more popular in Africa than Telegram is. And then because still people say that their information literacy was low, their digital literacy and technical literacy was low, we had to employ, okay, not employ, but use country champions to act as community liaisons. These were people that were responsible for relaying the sort of information and could actually be relied on to teach in case people had not turned up for class. And then we also used experienced Wikimedians to facilitate learning because it's one thing being a literate librarian, you're literate in the information world, but in the wiki world, your literacy is found wanting. And then we also delivered this in French and English. We did not deliver this in Portuguese because um, the audience just did not turn up for the party. So when all this was done, we found that from AFLIA's network of 30 countries, we actually got 469 participants from 34 African countries, as well as Asia, India, and Pakistan to be very specific. And uh, the course had been divided into five sections that are based on information literacy, the mission alignment between the resource that Wikipedia is, as well as the work that librarians do and the relationship in there. And then part of the course completion requirement was to create quality articles on the project that is Wikimedia sorry, on the project that is Wikipedia, 
uh, meaning that you know you look through the process of how does uh, content get onto Wikipedia, adhere to the content principles, adhere to things like the principle of notability. Also know that um, Wikipedia is an aggregator, yeah, it's not the be all and end all. So uh, over 843 quality articles were created, pages. And then also because there was um, uh, a digital skills gap as well as a gap in terms of the content we had on African information institutions, the visual content. Um, the participants kindly gave us 256, at, uh, sorry, 2,560 images. And um, this was actually in appreciation of the Creative Commons licenses because everybody thought they could go onto the internet download a stock picture and upload it. So the fact that we had this number of images being accepted is testimony to the fact that people were now aware of the Creative Commons licenses. And also because we know that Wikipedia is only as strong as its references, we had over 617,000 references added but that is just in terms of the content generated. We also had to look at um, the quality of the impact on the participants and the skills that they had. So previously, very many of them said that, you know, we don't know if there are any communities, local Wikimedia communities in our countries that can help us. And that number actually shifted. So you see that, um, the, the, the bottom half that I'm presenting now are the results that we got from the post course survey. Again, we had 400 plus respondents, 403 respondents to be uh, uh, very clear about that. And so 42.7 of these 403 now say that, yeah, we know our local affiliates. We've contacted our local Wikimedia user groups and chapters, and we are now doing some work with them. And 85.1% uh, had never hosted a wiki event before this, but that number has since dropped to 73.3%. And I'll be giving you a little bit of the details on that. And then before that, there was this perception index. Um, Wikipedia has a bad rap for a number of reasons, you know. <laughs> and most of the participants, a very big number of the participants joined out of curiosity to see if they could be disabused of their notions, to see if the myths could be busted. And I'm glad to say that the perception index out of five had actually risen to 3.95%. Let me use my primary format skills and round that up to four. So <laughs> there's a positive perception now among the participants. And also uh, very many people also had reported that their technical literacy was low or it was manifest in their participation in their activities. So I think because people had to work on mobile and mobile devices like tabs and laptops, we found that the computer and digital skills, as well as the research skills, had increased to those percentages cumulatively. So what then came up from that? There are participants who got out of the course saying that, you know what, I have enjoyed this so much, but I'm not going to enjoy this alone. I would request for such a partnership to specifically train the people in my locale. So we are going to look for potential, uh, potential partnerships and sponsorship from the Wikimedia Foundation and Zimbabwe Library Association comes to mind. They are aggressively following this up. So please stay tuned to your social media. We will be updating you on this. And um, as I'd mentioned before, the course was divided into five and the last was on community engagement, you know, for individuals to conceptualize how they could then, you know, begin manifesting the things that they had learned over these 12 weeks, how they could begin imparting this kind of skills to the community.
community, how they could share these kind of skills to the community, and uh, how they could further the vision and mission of the Wikimedia Foundation as well as their institutional goals. So again, Zimbabwe comes to mind. Zimbabwe and Kenya are the students from Zimbabwe and Kenya were able to host at least four events, four and counting. And then um, we also have uh, a photographic and structured data competition that revolves around uh, monuments and heritage sites. In Africa, it's called Wiki Loves Monuments. And for the very first time, the individuals that actually work in the Museum of Natural History in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe said, listen, we are taking this up and we are going to be contributing images and using the skills that we have gained to contribute to the metadata that is in Wikipedia. And then there've been some other events in Fara State in Nigeria. And right now, as I speak, it's still ongoing. There's an editor phone at Laris at the University of uh, Ilorin in Nigeria as we speak. So these are the kind of things that the participants from the course have been imparting to people within their community. I cannot give you all the numbers without waxing lyrical. So I shared a link to the final report of the project. And in case anybody has any questions, I am still in the room and I'd like to hand the virtual mic back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And thank you for such a, some really strong examples of what you're doing. I think that also underlines some really interesting arguments and really interesting characteristics of successful public access programs that often they're about partnerships. And um, it's not about libraries trying to do everything themselves. It's rather about libraries bringing the skills, the characteristics, the qualities they have to the table and combining them. So in this case, the existing knowledge around information literacy, the outreach, the knowledge of communities, the knowledge of information, full stop of librarians, combining that with the platform, with the support that Wikimedia Foundation can provide, the platform that Wikipedia is, in order to help correct that imbalance of content of the internet, to help, help people see themselves as creators of information and make sure that their communities find materials that are relevant for them. So thank you for that, Alice. Indeed, please do post the report, the link to the report in the chat. Um, now we're going to head further west again, and we're going to hear from Ezio Neira Magania, who is based in Peru. He's the former institutional head of the National Library of Peru, and is a writer, editor, and translator, as well as being a scholar at the Liberal Arts Facility at the Adolfo Ibanez University in Chile. So. Uh, uh, Ezio is joining us by video, so I'm going to share the video clip, but he will also get given an opportunity to hear more about the importance of providing access to content as one of the unique contributions that public access in libraries plays to meaningful connectivity, plays to contributing to new development models. Good morning, my name is Ezio Neira in the I apologize, I'm just going to Good morning, my name is Ezio Neira, I'm the former uh, institutional head of the National Library of Peru. And it is a great honor for me to be part of this round table and to be able to share some of the library services that we developed at the National Library, mainly during the pandemics, and of course, making use of uh, information communications uh, technology. I like to share uh, my screen so I can uh, share a PowerPoint uh, presentation with you. This very short talk uh, is called Public Access for Development in Peru, Remote and Vulnerable User Groups in Focus. And uh, to begin, I'd like to give some context about the access to internet in Peru. 
as of the last quarter of two of 2020, it was estimated that 70% of the population access the internet through smartphones. At the same time, at the beginning of 2021, only 40% of Peruvian households reported to have access to internet. That's why we decided at the National Library to migrate towards uh, what we called um, a strategy of multi modality of library services, uh, mainly because, as you could see, there is an important gap that we had to take into account in order to fulfill the institutional mandate. As a consequence, we developed a multi-modality strategy to bring the National Library closer to the public. This strategy made use of three different environments, the remote, the face-to-face, -face, and the virtual. And of course, I will be focusing on the latter. Uh, we use we we developed two kinds of actions using the ICM. In the first place, what is related to actions of access to information, cultural knowledge, and secondly, actions for the promotion and diffusion of heritage. Uh, first of all, I like to speak about the Biblioteca Pública Digital that was launched in 20 in July 2020 and in almost a year and a half of operation has about uh, 30,000 active users and more than 60,000 loans have been uh, made. It is also a digital library that contributes extensively to the national education system uh, mainly due to the lack of a digital school library here in Peru. One more uh, action is this uh, website uh, created to provide access to a great variety and relevant information resources regarding the 17 development goals of the 2030 uh, agenda. We also uh, offered uh, courses in Peruvian native languages as well as classes of both mathematics and Spanish grammar in order to help students that are applying for a college. Also, uh, within actions of access to information, culture and knowledge, I like to speak about the academic uh, programs uh, that uh, consists of a keynote uh, talks offered by academics and experts from different countries, from different parts parts from different parts of the world. The programs have been uh, truly successful uh, with on some occasions as many as 3,500 people watching the talks live. It also allowed people from different parts of Peru and from different uh, parts of the world to access high quality contents uh, for free. Now, uh, on the second uh, kind of actions, I like to talk about the uh, actions for the promotion of uh, heritage. Uh, first of all, I like to talk about Memoria Peru, uh, Recorridos por el Patrimonio de la Biblioteca Nacional, that offers a tour of the different collections that the National Library uh, protects. These are grouped into four major routes, creators, imagined communities, views from art and transitions and social transformations. Uh, it uh, also uh, incorporates, to begin with, uh, 15 specific microsites that allow uh, access to very important materials that are uh, protected at the National uh, Library. Uh, finally, I'd like to speak about the transcriptome that uh, consists, consists of making all materials from the National Library available to the public. So after taking a free course in paleography offered by the National Library, they could uh, transcribe the handwritten texts into contemporary Spanish. Until now, about a thousand transcripts have been made. Uh, about 900 participants have uh, taken part into this action. Uh, more than 10,000 uh, people visited the website. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, more than uh, 60,000 people uh, have been part of the reproduction, reproductions of the uh, different events related to the transcriptome. Uh, well, 
thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I hope this presentation was uh, of your interest and I like to send my best wishes for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ezio, and, and, and thank you for highlighting those issues around content and, in fact, how, how so often libraries do contain fantastic wealth of locally relevant content, but there's just that need to make it available, to get it into people's hands in a way that works for them through infrastructures, through community mobilization, for transcribing, which is incredibly important, through making sure, of course, that we also have copyright laws in place that allow for access. So with the examples that we've had so far, we've heard some really good cases of existing initiatives that are taking place. And while these are initiatives that very much are focused on responding to local need and having a local effect through the combination of internet access and the unique characteristics of libraries, we've also seen that these are initiatives that can scale up, but we can plan for effective public access that supports local development at the regional level, at the national level, as Alice said, at the continental level. There's so much potential in there that we can already see on the ground. But now what we want to do in the final section of this, before we go to the opportunity for questions and answers, is think rather about what are the, the, the next ideas? What are the, um, what are the new ideas that we can be thinking about, the new possibilities that there are so that we can really go one step further, get even more people connected in a way that's meaningful, in a way that really supports inclusive, sustainable development going forward. So with that, I would like to first hand over the floor to uh, Deborah Prado, um, who is from the, the Association for Progressive Communications, and she's in a community networks, so she's community networks project communications associate. Deborah has a background in communications and human rights, particularly women's rights and freedom of expression. Her work at APC focuses on developing and implementing strategic communications plans, spaces and outputs related to community and local networks. So I look forward to hearing your ideas for the future and your, your open horizon work. Deborah, over to you. Hi, thank you, Stephen, and thank you all. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today to discuss a community-based development model. Could, could I say, you, you're, you're a little bit quiet there, Deborah. Are you able to speak a little bit closer to the mic or a little bit louder? Can you hear me better now? That's better. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. No, no problem. I will be holding the mic, so it's better. No, I was just thank you uh, for the introduction and the opportunity and say that I'm very glad to be here today uh, to discuss this topic and learning from such impressive experience. Um, as I have been introduced, I'm Deborah. Uh, I'm based on Brazil and I have been working with strategic communications with the Local Networks Initiative. This is an, an initiative uh, led by APC in partnership with Rizomatica to contribute to and enable ecosystem for the emergence and growth of community based uh, connectivity initiatives in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And for, from our experience, we know that uh, digital inequalities are persisting and even increasing in different dimensions. And with the current approach uh, to, no, to connectivity, uh, we have seen the importance of a complementary approach towards universal and meaningful access. And the context of the pandemic pointed out to the urgency of ensuring the right to information and made it, its relation to connectivity even more visible to the world. Um, and working with strategic communications in an international network allowed me to know more uh, about innovative experiences happening in different countries. And I would like to briefly share a bit on three of them with you today. Uh, the first one is from the De Democratic Republic of Congo, where La Difference partnered with the shiftdom of the island of Ouija to build Pamojonet, a community-owned network that provides internet access to an average of uh, 150 people per day. With a complex story of rights violations and natural disasters, internet access could be become another missing piece in a complex puzzle of absence in the region, but the community uh, approach have tackled that. In South Africa, 
the Zeleni Community Network is building change uh, with access since 2012. This community network has been growing its capacity to provide internet connectivity while generating a local source of income alongside community members in South Africa. This is a region also crossed by historical discrimination and profound inequalities. And uh, the Zeleni Networks, community networks, build a model that seeks to address local needs and put community members at the center. Nowadays, it offers mobile charging stations and runs a quality high-speed internet service, and it has connected more than 13,000 people and 10 institutions and provided important support in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This, this community network actually played a vital role in the region by adding network infrastructure to extend the community internet access points since Ujid's triplet with the pandemic. Uh, it also ensured free and open access to several websites, such as for education and public health and start to raise awareness of the health status that matched local circumstances. Uh, the third example that I, I would like to share, it came from Brazil, where I came from, and in the past few years, I have been involved in an action research project to build a community network in the Quilombo, a traditional community called Ribeirão Grande Terra Seca. This community network is being built with a local agroecological network of women farmers here in Brazil. And as in many countries here, the pandemic led to a time when essential activities such as school and access to emergency financial assistance from the government moved uh, online as a consequence of the social distance measures. The pandemic also highlighted the importance of communication for personal relationships and the exchange of affections in challenging times. In these scenarios, this community network that I have been involved in uh, and the internet access it provided in this region, increasingly daily communications alternatives, helping people to communicate with relatives who live outside the Quilombo to check and look for each other in these uh, really challenged times we are living. It's important to highlight that in all these three experiences that I brought as examples, the women from the community had a crucial role and also the networks were built on the needs of the community. Experiences like those show us the importance of public access, of models and places where people can access information and public services, including uh, in vital situations as the one living worldwide now with the pandemic. They allow uh, local communities to develop their digital skills and technologies, to share their stories and develop local content as others in some sessions that you could watch in, uh, here in NIGF yesterday. They can be an opportunity to support women and other often marginalized groups. But uh, these stories are, are also about our own right to information because without public connectivity, all of us on those kind of projects will not have the chance to listen and learn from multiple communities living in different contexts. Uh, we would not uh, know about leave it and concrete examples where access is linking, linked to many other fundamental rights. And also public connectivity uh, is an enabler to look uh, at what is around and to the local experience and not being a producer of uh, structural silences and inequalities. So uh, to support the development of digital skills and technologies local to a lower bottom-up approach to build a more effective and inclusive approach on connectivity, we need public access. Uh, with it, we can all learn together. And uh, I want to say that by listening to the great interventions here today, I could see many synergies between community networks, this kind of community centers and libraries experience around the world. This made me to reflect on how could community centers collaborate with libraries or even what uh, the centers could learn from the public libraries experiences and strategies. And I know that uh, we shared the commitment to build a community based development model and uh, a more inclusive future. So uh, I'm really eager to engage in the dialogue with you here today. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and also the opportunity to be here learning from you today. Thank you so much, Deborah. And I, I'm, I'm not even going to try to paraphrase what you said because you said it so well. I think simply just to echo that point at the end that 
there is there's so much in common between the logic the spirit that drives community networks and the logic and spirit that drives libraries so I think certainly it's probably one of the questions to look at subsequently is how can we make sure that all the different movements working towards an inclusive model of digital development are able to work together that libraries can be mobilized as partners within this and contribute effectively. So now, finally, I would like to hand over to, to Don Means, who has extremely kindly stayed up until stupid o'clock in the morning in order to join us from the west coast of the US. Um, Don Means is, uh, as many of you may have heard from him before, he's been a, an extremely long time friend of, of libraries, an extremely effective advocate for connectivity in libraries because of the unique potential that this provides and as a practitioner he's run so many different projects showing what can be done making things happen and today he's going to join us and he's going to talk us talk us through a particularly interesting model now for making sure that libraries are connected and able to support inclusive local development through low earth orbit satellites so don over to you thank you stephen uh, good morning uh, from california uh, it was not a problem to schedule this. I was otherwise free, uh, but it's great to be back at the, the DC PAL for, I have lost count of how many years now, but it's, an, it's important work. Uh, it's, it's underappreciated uh, as a general concept, public access, uh, and yet it's essential to uh, general participation. There's no way that everyone will be able to participate without a public access component of any strategy. And we've been championing that for a long time. Uh, your partnership point is well made, Stephen. <clears throat> and you remind me that we are uh, engaged in a partnership for public access, and that can be found at uh, P4PA, P number four PA.net. You'll see uh, an approach there that discusses public access, community networks. Uh, libraries and other community centers, and also offline internet, which we haven't really talked about, but is an alternative until connectivity arrives. And it's really connectivity that we're focused on as the Gigabit Libraries Network, an open collaboration of, of uh, uh, innovating libraries doing a range of uh, interesting projects. Uh, there have been so many points made today during the session about uh, the, the services, the environment, the skills, development, and so on that libraries provide. Uh, and it reminds me of what uh, the former head of the World Bank said recently was that uh, connectivity is essential, but it's insufficient. And that makes a really strong point that just a raw connection, a number of people, of course, can use that. But we're talking about 3.5 billion people yet to be connected uh, to the internet in a, in a meaningful way. And, and these, these people are going to need support to, to make good use of this amazing technology that's emerged here in the last quarter of a century. So I'm gonna chat briefly here, I know we're low on time, about uh, a new connectivity technology that has arrived it is arriving, should I say, in the form of low Earth orbit satellites, so-called LEO. Uh, most satellite connectivity, as many of you would be aware, comes through geostationary satellites, which are a good distance out, some 40,000 kilometers or more away from the planet that reduces the, uh, uh, that increases the lag time, so-called latency of a signal. And these are, you know, for, they're like the last resource for people that, uh, that need a connection. Low Earth orbit satellites are only at about um, 500 kilometers up. So uh, they also have other advantages of, of speed. Uh, there are a number of efforts to put these satellite constellations in orbit. The first one up is from uh, a SpaceX subsidiary, Starlink. And they are, uh, they're adding these at a, a phenomenal rate. They're launching like 50 satellites per, per launch. And they have roughly 2,000 up now of a, of a planned 12,000 or so, or, or more if, if uh, everything goes well. We just don't know. What, what we want to uh, uh, do with this is, is 
uh, advocate for libraries to be among the first users. Now, what the, the process is that these, these enterprises have to get permission from each national regulator, uh, communications regulator, for permission to operate. And so far, Starlink, as I said, being the only one that's really up yet, uh, has obtained that in, in some 20 countries. Most of those are, are uh, in the EU, but they're growing uh, rapidly. What's impressive about this is the, the, is the connectivity rates uh, are advertised at around 100 megabits, but we're seeing speeds of 200 and even 300 megabits, which is what Starlink has promised this year. That's a, that's a phenomenal, I mean, that's ordinary high performance broadband, even with uh, fiber connection. Uh, so traditional economics, infrastructure economics says that the farther away you are from the, the core of the network, anything, you know, electricity, telephone, gas, water, the more expensive it is to deliver services just because of the distance. And the, and the, and the population you get farther away from these core networks is more, uh, more distributed and, uh, uh, and typically has lower incomes, all of which contributes to the fact that we have this digital divide. That's why 3.5 billion people are not connected. They're too expensive, according to the business plans of the traditional providers, to serve. With the satellite connections, the cost of delivery is essentially the same. You know, it's up and down. So the cost to connect downtown Paris is roughly the same thing as outer Mongolia. And so that's, that's unique. And that's, that's really uh, has us excited about the prospects for connecting libraries uh, who, and then the other question of course is affordability. Currently the, the cost of this is uh, roughly a hundred dollars a month or a or hundred euros or so uh, for a subscription, which is gonna be well out of the range of affordability for large numbers of people. Hence the library in its classic model of pooling resources at the community level and then sharing them even on a limited basis. So it's not, it's not uh, broadband in every home, but it's, let's say, broadband in every community, which should be a primary goal, is that everyone should have proximate access to the Internet. Uh, there's another uh, uh, aspect of the, the conversation, which hasn't been touched on, of all the, the valuable things that libraries provide uh, in terms of public access to their services. Resilience is another one. That is to say... Uh, a re, an ability to respond to a range of crises. We thought mostly weather, climate-driven extreme weather events, which are happening more often and more extreme. But we've also uh, experienced now a crisis in a health, uh, a global health crisis. All of these things uh, refer back to the library as a responder, which it is. Uh, it's even more important. I mean, when these things happen, these events happen, you have to find out what's going on. You need to go somewhere if the connectivity is out. Even if you have an internet connection, it may be down because the electricity is off. So a library which has a, a source that's not susceptible to the local electrical outage, namely with a backup source and a, and a satellite connection could be an incredibly valuable source in a, in a, in a time of crisis. And, and that's a big deal. So the the We've, well, let me post that real quick. We have uh, started this project with um, a, a grant, excuse me, uh, a grant from the uh, U.S. Uh, Libraries uh, Agency, uh, the uh, uh, IMLS, uh, to test this out. And so the first libraries connected with the this LEO technology are in the mountain west of the US, uh, New Mexico, Montana, and Utah. And they're getting these kinds of uh, speeds in places which they had, you know, it was a big deal if they had a 25 megabit connection. And now they're suddenly with 250 megabit connection. So this is a dramatic opportunity to shift the equation and we think that it's not going to happen without this kind of technology, that the traditional infrastructure creeping along the landscape, adding more towers or, or running more wires is just not going to get far enough, fast enough for people who need this kind of information and services to be able to get it. 
So we hope that um, everyone will search this technology out. We hope that you will make inquiries in your country uh, with your national regulator. Are they, what stage are they of consideration of this technology and uh, what are the plans for it? And, and to the degree that you would agree about what we think is a potential benefit, we do have to find out if this all will work, but that's the point. That's one of the things libraries do is investigate early technology. But to inquire with your regulator uh, and, and to suggest that it may have uh, uh, enormous benefit to the unconnected people in your, in your country and perhaps then offer uh, to uh, lead in the exploration of it. So I'll stop there. That's that link that shows the uh, release that we did in June uh, and gives the overview. Uh, and you can all search Starlink and LEO uh, satellite technologies and, and satisfy yourselves as to the various technologies and business models and, and so forth that are involved there. It's, it's really complex. <laughs> But it seems to be done. It seems to be happening. And our early results are very positive. So we'll hope this may really goose up the, uh, the uh, distribution and the availability of this resource we've discovered has become critical to participation in, in the modern digital society. So thanks again for uh, listening and good luck to everyone. And uh, hopefully we have some time for discussion. Thank you very much, John. Indeed, we do have some time. We have got about 10 minutes for discussion. Um, so again, instead of trying to paraphrase what people have said, I think I'd like to encourage the audience, both online and in person, to think, you know, what recommendations would you have? What do you think needs to be done? What are the ingredients of an action plan for making sure that we really do take advantage of the potential of public access and libraries, that we're able to take advantage of this potential in order to drive inclusive local development? Is it connectivity? Is it skills? Is it investment? Is it regulation? Um, I'd like, first of all, actually, to, to, to offer the floor to Ramona Petruchovaite, who has been sitting on the stage and is, is a, has been co-organizing this session with us. Um, Ramona, did you have anything that you'd like to add or some initial suggestions? Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Um, I think through this um, session, we wanted to just show examples, good examples and practices and how libraries with public access, but also community networks can contribute to better lives uh, across the globe. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, during pandemic, we just realized once again that not all communities can, can enjoy this. And, uh, and really public libraries and communities need a better infrastructure and also access to digital skills training uh, to, <clears throat> to cope with the situation. And I would call you upon the all connectivity initiatives that are raising now and also capacity building initiative um, that are funded by public funding and also businesses to just consider libraries as the players, as well as community-based organizations as the players of local, that can bring local changes. This is, I think, very important. And, and at the same time, encourage libraries and community-based organizations to reach out to other players and explain their potential and commitment because this is also important dialogue and, and showing that we want to partner. Thank you very much. And I, I think that, that that's such a key point. I think it, it's a line that we have certainly used before that it, it was pre-pandemic, it was it, pre-pandemic, it was a, a problem that not everyone connect, was connected. During the pandemic, we've seen that it's a crisis when we have large shares of the population, even in countries that are seen as being rich, that simply don't have access to the internet. And so have been shut off from all the potential that this brings. So there's really that need to do things differently. You know, we can't just assume that the old solutions will work. We need to step up a gear. We need to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. Um, 
I'd like to open the floor fully now. I don't know if there's anyone in the physical audience who has a question or a comment based on your own experience. I'm also keeping an eye on the online participants in case there are any hands raised there. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds and I'm going to rely on the colleagues. Okay, thank you. We have a question, so I'm getting up to take a microphone. Uh, Stefan, we have one question and comment. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks so much. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Tony Woodall. I'm at the Alliance for Affordable Internet. So could, could you speak a little bit closer to the microphone? So it's a bit it's a bit dodgy online but <laughs> no worries how about do. now hopefully this is working Perfect. i'll come back much better, much better. thank there you there we go uh so it'll balance out um yeah so i'm teddy woodhouse at the alliance for affordable internet not a librarian but a huge fan of libraries um so yeah uh, i guess i just wanted to respond from my perspective on your question Stephen, of where is there a space for us to think about a space for action and from my perspective i think uh, where things are headed, there's there's a lot of focus right now on individual access and measuring internet access at the individual level, which can be good in a number of ways, um, but that is in particular leading to mobile internet metrics. So it's smartphone ownership, it's having a mobile internet subscription, which is one type of connectivity, but I think libraries in particular, and so many of these examples have been so great because of how they're demonstrating this point for me, other aspects of connectivity that are a bit richer. It's other devices that are gonna be more expensive than what someone can be affording at a household level or at a family level. Um, and so what I think would be really compelling to see is uh, you know, suggestions around what are kind of almost community level connectivity metrics that are, you know, is there going to be a public access point in every community? You know, is there going to be desktop computers at a certain ratio? Things like that that are kind of almost a second layer of indicators that are going to be really important for governments that are making these policies and decisions of how that comes together. Um, so yeah, that's my perspective. Um, thank you everyone for a great, great session so far. Fantastic. I, I really like that proposal as well, that we should think about collective connectivity rather than purely individual and the risk of skewing our view of things if you think in that way. Um, we've not got much time, but we have a hand up from Akintunde Siriki, who's joining us online. Akintunde, are you able to unmute and speak? Uh, hello, good, af uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening across the world. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this um, discussion. Um, basically, uh, I'm from Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm just going to share from my perspective uh, this. I, I, I kind of um, like the idea of using libraries as a, as a point of, um, of spreading uh, the digital awareness and connectivity across communities. But um, in terms of specific challenges from like what I've seen in Poland, for instance, the number of uh, public libraries available and all that, it's quite easy to look at the, what they're doing with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the system that they already have. The challenge we have here most times in probably the African region and mostly in Nigeria where I'm from, is that we don't really have so many public uh, public libraries available. Like it's not um, not like every community has a public library, for instance. And uh, most libraries available are really very much underfunded. So before you can even talk about you know bringing in equipment or connecting to the um, the satellites, for instance, at uh, at um, um, don't mean to explain the other time. Uh, we have to talk about even how the libraries are functioning in the first place in our regions and look at where you know we're lacking in the first place. Um, what I feel uh, is, is an access for us is that um, the places where I know we can easily have access to libraries are in schools, at um, high schools and uh, you know, different um, primary schools and all that. And I'm looking at if uh, there is a kind of consideration to tap in into that uh, that segment rather than just looking at public community public uh, libraries, maybe we could talk about you know going into schools and getting them to like probably open up sometimes for people around them to just uh, around the area to come in and use their libraries sometimes you know and also build something around the students to ensure that you know the access to, to internet using those libraries are also you know part of the plan in the entire project. That's just my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's an extremely powerful point about 
we already see there are some fantastic examples of family literacy that are driven by the engagement of school libraries. And there are places where school libraries effectively then do open up to the community as a whole using that possibility. So we, we've come to time and, and I think it's a good, it, it's good practice obviously to end on time so we don't hold people back from moving on to the next event. Um, I'm conscious this is a discussion that could really continue. So um, as before, I very much encourage you to, to look at the report we've already put out, the draft report about um, measuring impacts. I might ask Valencia to put a link to that in the chat. Um, I think, as I said, this is a conversation that can continue. I think there's a toolbox, there's a range of initiatives that are needed. So from integrating libraries properly into connectivity strategies, integrating connectivity into development strategies, drawing on the strengths of libraries, making sure that libraries have the laws and skills necessary to do things, making sure that we're making the most of the partnerships that we can have in order to actually deliver. There's plenty that can be done. Hopefully we look forward to working with anyone interested, anyone active in this, in order to actually make these changes happen on the ground, to make sure that all of the good work that's taking place, these great examples that we heard at the beginning, um, sorry, that we heard from the beginning, um, from Yuan, from Magda, from Agnieszka, from Ezio, from Alice, that we can really spread these examples, take advantage of the fact, and make sure that really public access and libraries plays a really full role in building back better and building a more inclusive future. With that, I want to thank you to all of our speakers, to repeat again to Yuan, to Agnieszka, to Magda, to Ezio, to Alice, to Don, to Deborah, to Valencia. Thank you so much for your interventions and I wish you a very happy and successful rest of the IGF this year. Thank you and goodbye. Uh, we would like also thank you, Stephen, for moderating this session, Valencia for preparing and uh, participants for that you will be with us today. Thank you.